Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Let's go to China. Shall we go to China today? This is going to be easy because I get to sit at my computer and have a wonderful excursion led by a professor of anthropology at the University of Manitoba, a woman who has spent a good part of her life doing research in the rural areas of China. This is Ellen Judd. Hello, Ellen. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Meta? Wonderful. All right, so we're, uh, I know that you can't go to China these days, so, um, but you, send, you seem to be sending your graduate students abroad. Is that, is that something that's working? <laughs> well, and they're coming here, so that, that's just the way in which teaching is going these days. But um, yes, things have been closed down a little bit. So um, yeah. I, I hope to get uh, back to China later this year. Good. Uh, I've been to China, but I don't know where I was. <laughs> um, where were you most of the time, or did you hop around? I went to a, a fair number of different places. I started out as a graduate student in China, in, in, in Beijing and Shanghai. And then I did a lot of, spent a lot of time in Shandong, and then later in Sichuan, Chongqing, in, in the southwest of China, uh, looking at the places that... Uh, had sent migrants to the cities. And then I went to the cities uh, where they'd gone to Guangzhou and Chongqing. Um, and, and I've been to other places, but those are probably the locations where I've spent most time. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, it, it, I know I, I was there in 1980. And that's the only time I've ever been to China for a couple of weeks. It was at a time when it was uh, really, we were a novelty. I mean, uh, I, I remember being in a bus and these people would come and they put their noses up against the glass and look at us, you know, as if we were really um, quite remarkable things. <laughs> but uh, that must not have lasted very long, but I imagine uh, you, you sort of put roots down, right? Yes, I, I, I sort of have friends and it's been, um... A, a large part of my life from from my early twenties until now. So, um, so you have a lot of friends in China, and and you speak. What do you speak? I mean, they have all these different. I, I speak standard Chinese, um, and that's that is all Mandarin, that's, right? Yes, right. Uh, that's usually what we call it in, in in Canada. In China, they just call it the standard language. It's the um, the language of the North China Plain. Uh, so it's widely spoken uh, across northern China and, and down into Sichuan and Chongqing too, with regional variations. And then it's taught in schools everywhere. So uh, one, one can go lots of places with it. And I, I can understand some of the local dialects, but it's a bit as if um, when one goes to Yorkshire, you know, one listens to how people yeah. speak, but one still oneself speaks whatever version of English one speaks. So. Um, what I speak is, is Mandarin, but I could get around. Uh -huh. Well, I, I presume that everybody in China, all the students uh, must learn what you call standard Chinese, right? Uh, uh, it's just, uh, even if they have a, a local language, they also would learn the basic Mandarin. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, Right. I was just reading something today about the fact that the there's more um, effort to standardize um, education in uh, some of the um, uh, peripheral uh, regions of China, um, and I I could sort of understand why that might be helpful, um, but you know there's always a controversy about how much to do, even within Canada, how much one should do in. Uh, local or in you know, ethnic lang uh, languages and so on. I think in the years past, there were a lot more uh, Saturday schools in things like Ukrainian and stuff in Canada than there is now. So I imagine that we're becoming more uh, standardized in French and English. Do you think or not? Yes, I, th I think people like to speak their own language. And certainly there's lots of pushback in China and certainly people who speak a very different language and the minority nationalities want to keep their own language. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so that happens. And even in localities, you know, lots of people just want to speak their own version of Chinese. It's, it's sort of, it's what feels comfortable and anything else is uppity and, and they don't want to do it. But it is important in terms of their mobility and so on to also have that ability. Right. Okay. Now you, um, I'm impressed with your green screen, which by the way, looks like the real thing. I mean, uh, a lot of times when people use green screens, if they move, the, <laughs> there's a funny looking space behind them, but you have a, a remarkable green screen, obviously of China. Can you, can you tell us what we're seeing in, in the background? Right, this is um, a school that's under construction outside uh, a, a township in Sichuan, where I was, uh, where I spent a while. And I think it's, I, I thought it was nice and it's one I use in my classes um, because it, it, it shows a little bit of the countryside and it also hints at all the transformations that are underway as people are uh, going to school and preparing themselves for, for, for life anywhere and also especially in the cities because there's this huge movement of people from the countryside to the cities that's fueling China's rise in the world. Um, so it's sort of a, an optimistic um, and important part of what's happening in China. Yeah, uh, in fact, I, I would imagine that the Chinese <laughs> Uh, modernization or, um, I don't know, industrialization or whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the development of China in the last 30 years must be one of the most extraordinary rapid changes, social changes in the world history. I mean, they have done something spectacular with their economic development. And I would like to see you know, any of China, but um, that's what I hope you'll tell us more about. The move from, I think in most cases, it's an urbanization move, right? A lot of people in the countryside move to the cities and take uh, jobs in industry. Is that what the basic uh, dynamic of the thing? Um, it, 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 it's part of what's happening. So, I think that one of the important things about the, the Chinese economy and, and society is that it's in a sense bifurcate between the, the urban worlds and the rural worlds. And to some extent, people are, have, have an entitlements and are registered as living in one or the other. And there's this incredibly modern, uh, fast paced world of the, the major cities and, and, and of urban China that is sort of amazing the world. And it's probably all, it's been a huge cultural center, you know, for thousands of years anyway, but it is amazing right now in, the, in, in these places. And then there is where most of the people in China live, which has been in the countryside, but is increasingly being urbanized. But one of the things that has been happening is that, um, China has that modern industrial economy that's been developing through the 20th century and into this century. But when it did this opening up since the 1990s, it also um, became a place to which countries like the United States put out some of their work. So there's a sense in which China is also a very large export uh, processing zone. So we have these. Are, I'm sorry. Are you saying that even in the countryside, there's uh, there are uh, pre, uh, industrial facilities going in for export, or uh, just in the cities? No. The what? What's there had been a period in the 1980s when some of it was in the countryside, but what's happened uh, since the 1990s is that that's been developing more in the cities and the coastal regions, but people who are still considered to be part of the rural population and have a foot and largely their families in the countryside are in the cities. So something like 250 million rural people are in the cities working in temporarily, but still with ties to the countryside, but they're in the cities doing this um, 
making all these things that we buy in all our shops, right? So in a sense that these rural people are one of the motors of um, Chinese development. And I think some of the time when we look at what China's doing, we don't quite see all of the people who are doing the work. And it is people from the countryside who are going to the cities that are one of the engines of, of China's um, economic miracle. It, it, they don't do it by themselves. The, the, the secret is you know, the, the hinge between the, the urban and the rural uh, e economies and the ability of them to work together to, to, to transform the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you specialize more in talking to villagers, right? And people live, rural people don't live scattered around. They live in villages mostly, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on the region of China. Sometimes it's in um, nucleated villages and sometimes it's a bit more spread out. It's partly a geographical and regional difference. Mm -hmm. um, so so you, you, you find both. Mm -hmm. And some of the reality right now is how mobile the rural population is and how much of it uh, is is partly in the cities. Um, I went to, to rural China. I'd been a student in China um, in the 1970s. And I wanted to be able to see the countryside. So when it became possible for um, international researchers to get to the countryside in the 1980s, that's what I wanted to do because it seemed not visible at that time to the outside world. Uh, and it's where most people were. And, and so the majority of the Chinese people have a, a, a rural designation. So it seemed to me that to understand what was going on in China, this is sort of key to, to life in China. And at present, you know, people don't necessarily see it uh, when they travel to China, but it is, it, it, it's life for a very large portion of, of the Chinese people. So I, I wanted to see that. So that's what I did, but it's not, um, I certainly spend time with colleagues in universities and spend time in the cities as well. Oh, so you uh, you visit universities. Uh, what what is uh, do you teach there? Do you hang out in research institutes, or what what do you do in universities? Um, I, I, my research in the countryside is sometimes done in, in collaboration with people in, in universities. So I, I've, I've given some uh, lectures there, but I haven't gone to teach. I'm mm -hmm. based in Canada. Mm -hmm. Well, I have heard that, and, and, and maybe uh, you can elaborate on whether it's true, that um, there's a lot of democratization going on, but it's it is locally, it is usually in a, in a local sense that, that people in villages have quite a lot of opportunity to make decisions locally. Is that, is that a fair um, statement or uh, would, or not? <laughs> There's a, a, a tension in that sense in which there, there is a strong central government, but there are also um, local structures and they're, um, one of the standard sayings in, in China is, you know, there's policy from above and there's opposition from below. So, you know, to some extent, what, what people do is they do have some structures uh, for managing their own affairs in, in, in communities, but it, it's not without paying attention to what national policy is. So there's a, a dynamic there that is not structured the same as, as here, but it, but it is there. And compared with when I first went to China, I would say there's uh, probably more sphere for people to make um, individual decisions about where they will go. And it's uh, sort of a transformation from a situation in which it was more equal and everybody got, um, there was full employment and everybody got a job, but they got assigned one. Now it is not so equal and people have to go out and find their own work, but they get a bit more choice about what they do. And that has an upside and a downside to it as, as well. I don't know any foreign language, even French. Uh, but uh, I, I wish I could understand enough of a language to just sit in a coffee shop in you know, mm -hmm. some, some little town and, and listen to what people talk about. So, uh, you know, 
do you ever write papers about what people are interested in or what they talk about in in everyday life in their social gatherings or so on what what is life like f- from the perspective of people living in a, a one of the villages that you've <clears throat> that you've studied a very large people family and so what people are are dealing with is their, their relationships with other people and their obligations and how they're uh, caring for their children and, and their elders and, and the work that they are doing in order to make their community work. Um, and since life in, in the countryside, uh, to a large extent outside the suburban areas, is still very hard and demanding. People are uh, t- tend to be working very hard and they also have considerable care obligations for, for both children and elders. The people of working age are going to the cities and the countryside has become a a place of giving and receiving care in some ways. So there's a great deal of um, concern about about how one manages um, Mm -hmm. all of these conflicting needs to be working and to be uh, caring for people at the same time. Yeah, well, that's another thing that I've heard a lot about and maybe... To, maybe it's uh, an exaggerated story. I don't know that so many of the urban people are are married couples, or at, at any rate, family people who leave their children behind with their parents in the in the village while they go off and live in the city, and then come home when they can for a vacation or to stay in touch. How um, that's maybe a stereotype. I don't know. Is that um, a predominant pattern or is it that is does it mean that there's not enough uh, housing or um, child care facilities or things like that for for them to bring their their children with them it's it's not what one would say was is a preference it's something that people more or less have to do in um for for a at least a portion of their their life because they can't very well um, it, it's difficult for many of the the rural people to be able to have um, a sufficient income and uh, to, to be able to support their children and, and work full time in the city um, it, it's it's just sort of not manageable mm-hmm. and to some extent even in the countryside young people would be working while grandmothers and to some extent, grandfathers were also caring for their children during the day. So young people are, are key to the workforce. Uh, the, the, the problem with this, this model that's existed for a while is that people sometimes have to be more separated um, from their elders and generationally um, than in the past when you could work in, in your own rural community. So in order to care well for their families, people sometimes have to be separated from, from some of their from, from their parents and their children uh, for a while. And, and people have certainly tried very hard to take people to the cities when they can. Mm-hmm. Um, that's difficult. But one of the transitions that China is working on is to urbanize so that more people are absorbed permanently into the uh, urban workforce and they can bring their families and they can settle um, permanently in, in cities to a greater degree. So that kind of dis- disruption of family life in order to work uh, can be reduced. And, and that's um, a process that's going to take a little while to make work, but there, there's a sense in which some people are able uh, then to, to settle in the cities in a more, more settled way. And that will be an important transition. Uh, and it's happened in many other parts of the world that the people, first of all, move temporarily to the cities, and then they, you know, become urbanized. You kind of confirm the impression that I got from the general press that this is a very widespread thing now, but that they're trying to get past it, right? Would would they be building um, uh, apartments or, or uh, housing for people in, in the cities that would be adequate for family life? Is that the goal or...? Increasingly, but it, it's for the temporary workers. It, it, it's not great, um, but yes, there is that kind of transition to a better way of life, and and I think that's one of the the things that I think we sometimes 
don't necessarily see in terms of contemporary press coverage about, about China, um, the extent to which um, China's um, economic and political life is um, driven by an internal imperative to make all of this possible for hundreds of millions of people. So, you know, basically, you know, to, to be able to establish all that infrastructure is the product of incredibly hard work and also trying to manage the economy in such a way that um, it, it can sustain that level of growth and, and build that infrastructure for people. Well, uh, yeah. Now, you uh, tell me what, what kinds of uh, articles you've written. Well, it's been a long period with different kinds of research. I started out studying um, the Cultural Revolution, um, but then, uh, and I've studied uh, popular uh, performing arts and so on. But uh, as in the countryside, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, the transformation of the rural economy and how family life and gender relations have been changed. Because some of the time from a distance, everything seems about political economy, but as people live it on the ground, it often turns out to be about how they manage their, their family life and their uh, household relations. So I, I did quite a bit of that. And then I looked at how the women's movement responded to that and looked at sort of indigenous ideas of um, the transformation of women's roles in the economy and, and recognition of, of women's contributions. Um, later on, I looked more at my migration and uh, at the restoration of uh, social programs, uh, in particular uh, healthcare in the countryside. Um, some of that had been uh, dismantled as in the rural economic reform um, that happened. Uh, we sometimes call it decollectivization. In China, it was the rural economic reform. And to some extent, social programs were lost when collectives were um, transformed into local government. And then there's been a rebuilding of what we would call social programs in China, healthcare and pensions and so on, for the last 15 years or so in the countryside. And so I looked at the um, reemergence of um, the rural healthcare program and then at patterns of- Sorry, you, know, you how people healthcare programs, did you say? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, looking at how people manage their healthcare needs in terms of accessing public, um, familial, and uh, and private resources. So from from a problem solving kind of approach in the countryside and and for for migrants. What I'm trying to get at is looking at it from the point of view of how how it's lived on the ground. So that's what I do professionally. Uh huh. Okay. Uh I'd be interested in, in two of the things that you've mentioned. One is what have the changes been in gender relations and have you been able to see it over a period of time? And can you, can you make any sweeping generalizations about how that has gone? And then uh, I'd be interested in more also the, uh, the changing healthcare system if, uh, that you've mentioned. I remember hearing back in the day when, you know, they were talking about barefoot doctors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also had friends who've studied Chinese traditional medicine here, as if this is a good way of amplifying what we do. And I, it's made me wonder, in fact, I, I went to China, I've gone to two or three Chinese doctors just for fun more than anything else. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much traditional Chinese medicine is is uh, still a part of the everyday practice of healthcare uh, in village life? Those are big questions. Um, I'll have them. You can pick either one, <laughs> gender or health. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about gender, but I would say that certainly traditional Chinese medicine is still used and, and, and promoted. Uh, and, and they're two tracks and they're, and they're both, and sometimes they're combined. So, so all of that's um, flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, gender relations has changed a great deal. And I think it's one of the things that's been um, quite transformed. A great many more opportunities are open uh, to women than, than they had been in the past. 
transformation and access to, to education in the countryside in particular. That happened earlier in the cities and, and somewhat later in, in, in the countryside. Um, women are a, a very active part of, uh, of every part of the economy. Um, there's certainly not, you know, I think we used to have ideas about them being left behind in the countryside and they're certainly not. They're um, also moving and, and the ability to move and work in the cities gives a degree of uh, enhanced opportunity and freedom, um, but they nevertheless you know, have um, extraordinary demands and obligations on them as well that, that are not equal. Um, and, not and that's, equal, yeah. Well, you know, it's, gender is no, nowhere equal yet, I, maybe Scandinavia, well, but uh, I, you know, if you were doing a cross, a, an international comparison of progress toward gender equality, uh, how would you say China stacks up in terms of, for example, the role of women in, in um, industry or in leadership roles or government and so on? I think the striking thing in China is that the, the pace of change is extraordinarily rapid, um, but we don't find large numbers of women at the highest levels of the, uh, the political system. But, you know, the, as you say, these, these are problems that exist everywhere. So I, I, I think that... Um, Has anybody, do you know whether anybody's done an international comparison of gender uh, advancement or fe feminist advancement? I, I, I'm not aware of it, but then I don't specialize in feminism. So I don't know. I think that there are people who have looked at that. And at, at one point when um, the Chinese women when I was looking particularly at the Chinese women's movement, um, I, I could see efforts being made particularly to put women into um, positions of greater responsibility. Um, and, and it was a, a very interesting program that the women's federations at that time were developing that were very intentionally about linking women who um, were more professionally uh, placed and educated and linking them with women with uh, less advantage to, to build patterns of uh, mentorship and cooperation. And we find that more widely in the world now as well. So I think that the, the pace of change is very fast. There are people who've done those uh, comparative studies of women moving into elite positions. Um, it, it's not what I've done in particular. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But, 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 but it, do, it does exist. And I, I think the world is improving on this, but still has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's turn to health. Um, well, w if you have a choice, <laughs> would you have? Would you choose to go to a Chinese traditional doctor or a modern hospital for whatever you're likely to come down with in uh, in your travels in China? Where would you rather go? Use both. <laughs> and Do you? It, um, yes, I mean. It, a, a lot of the time, what ha what's happening with traditional Chinese medicine is it's um, the, the, the use of uh, herbal treatments that later have been adopted in pharmaceutical treatments in the West. So it's, it, it's perfectly legitimate you may have to take. Uh, it's not as refined as it is in tablets, but it, it's quite effective for, for colds and, and various other treatments. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that's just fine. It, it depends on what ails you, but some of the time I, I'll admit that I'm, I have a lot of respect for biomedicine, <laughs> so I to, you know, when really sick to, to go for that. But what, I, what I've been looking at mainly is uh, the effort to increase people's access to um, any form of health care, because that is so critical to, to people's well-being. And, and that, I think, has been um, something that's been really important to see, so that... Um, well, which are they emphasizing or, uh, you know, I guess I'm interested in this comparison of if the average person in a village, do they care what kind of health care they get, modern or uh, traditional? Uh, and and uh, how do they think about this? Uh, it, it, are they, is there really a lot of improvement in access to treatment? And, um, and are they blending the two? 
Are they mixing them or do you find doctors that uh, specialize in one and the other, <clears throat> but, n but have no contact with people in the other branch of medicine? Uh, there are somewhat separate streams for training people in one or the other, but a, a lot of practitioners are able to use both. And so that um, from um, an ordinary person's point of view, you can choose one or the other. In the countryside where you may have a smaller number of uh, practitioners available, sometimes they're able to do uh, both to some, to some degree, um, but, but they are separate specialized streams and people have access to, to both. Um, I, I think the, the big issue is being able to ensure that people do have access. And that has been, um, I think, really important because um, I, I don't think there's a place where access to healthcare is not important. So basically um, being able to recreate a structure that um, improves people's access to um, healthcare, I think is one of the important things that China's managed to recreate. So at, at present, there's a, a structure for this that um, ideally reaches everybody. It's still underfunded, which is one of the reasons why China pushes constantly for more economic development. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a structure there that still needs to be more fully funded, but there's uh, th there are efforts to, to recreate that that have been underway for, you know, s since a time when we were trying to talk about post-neoliberalism, which one hardly hears anymore, but there had been a moment before the economic crisis in, in 2008, where, where we were talking about that and the recreation of social programs uh, throughout the world. And some places um, it, it's been hard to sustain and it's certainly been a struggle to, to create in China, but there's been a determination also to go ahead with that, uh, with the healthcare system and with the creation of uh, income support um, for elderly people in the countryside too. Um, so healthcare and pensions are, are, have been being recreated. But there's, there's still a lot of inequality, but there's work on this. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in uh, the world now, one of the things that interests me most, because I'm a political sociologist, is, uh, is the rise, of course, of populism and, and the, um, uh, all of these movements, such as Trump uh, in the U.S., and, but uh, around in other countries, Bolsonaro, and, uh, you know, you, you name it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, even Modi in India and so on, cleavage between rural culture and urban culture. You know, we have a, a real war practically going on between um, educated elites uh, in cities doing not you know, in the knowledge industries and, and so on. And um, the traditional people who want to stabilize life by going backward. I've found in the U.S. that the biggest uh, uh, gap in voting for Trump or Biden was the gap between rural and urban residents uh, so that we have all these people wanting, uh, you know, everything, uh, opposition to abortion, uh, uh, right to carry guns, opposition to gay, uh, gay marriage or gay uh, partnerships and so on. And, um, and, and so I see a huge um, cultural split in between rural and urban. And what I'm wondering is how much of that is similar to the case in China? There, there is a similar divide, um, but it, I, I don't think it gets in the sense that there's a rural urban distinction. Um, but I, I don't think it's elaborated in, in quite the same way. The, the way in which um, a preoccupation in China is very largely in terms of um, inequality and uh, or disparity, yeah. and so that um, there's there's a sense that life has been improving very much more in the cities. Not for everybody in the cities. There's also people who've been uh, laid off from failing uh, enterprises and so on. There there, there are 
certainly problems for some people in, in the cities, but there's a sense in which um, there's a, enormous inequality um, in China. And there's this sense on the part of many people, the, even the privileged people in the cities to be rather um, un uncomfortable about the disparity and the situation that they know exists in, in remote rural areas. So there's a sense and it probably comes out of a, this more, um, the socialist past in, in, in China. Um, and I, which, which I think is how a lot of people in China would also think of it, except oh, yeah? mm -hmm. probably should, shouldn't necessarily say so at, at present, but there's a, a sense in which things have become, um, the, the disparities have widened during this period of rapid economic growth and greater engagement with the, the global uh, capitalist economy. So that um, some people are doing very well and other people aren't. So it's, it's this um, huge disparity that is um, felt on, uh, on both sides. Of, and there's a sense that this is somehow not right, um, but nevertheless, it is, um, it, it is part of the structure. And you know, the, the overall thrust has been that if China is able to economically um, improve its situation rapidly enough, this can be uh, shrunk or conditions could be improved for a larger number of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and to some extent, you know, from 96 to 1996 to 2010, there was sustained 10% growth in GDP. And so people did experience an enormous increase in their standard of living. And it's still uh, one of the issues in China. In, in the past year, for example, as China's, you know, seemed to be such a, a, a force in the global economy, at the same time, uh, the premier was saying that their goal by the end of last year was to, um, raised 600 million people out of poverty. Um, and looking at the, the standard of a thousand renminbi a, a, a month income, which is about five US dollars per capita per day, they, they were trying to get, they still had that as a challenge before them. And to some extent they felt they had, they were on track to meet it until the COVID thing happened, but they still felt they'd gotten somewhere by the end of last year to, to, to meet this, um, this goal. So in many ways, uh, uh, the issue is uh, the enormous inequality between these two worlds. So there's this, this enormous wealth and then there's still people who are um, having to go to the cities under difficult circumstances and increasingly in an informal economy and, and people in the countryside who are dependent on somebody else making um, that, that kind of move in order to you know, send funds home to, to sustain uh, life. That's, to, I, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that there's a socialist background, because maybe that explains quite a bit. You know, um, I'm thinking of, of the people, you know, the, the basic value that leftism promotes is a egalitarianism, you know, that that is what leftism is all about, I would say. It, it isn't necessarily achieved, but it certainly is considered a very high priority in every left-wing government, socialist government, and so on. And, and I think um, in capitalist societies in Canada and the U.S. and Britain and so on, I don't think there's ever been the sense of what you say shame or the feeling that it, there's something really wrong with having um, a lot of economic inequality. I don't think most American voters are convinced that um, greater equality is the most important thing to, to be pursued. But I do see, I do remember seeing it so much in, in Russia when I, I was going to Russia quite, quite a lot in the eighties and and it, it was very important then. And I think it's not even as much the case in Russia now. I think that 
equality is not something that is so much a highly prized value as it used to be. And, but if people in formerly socialist societies, I, I just wonder, it would be interesting to see whether that value still has a, a strong appeal to, to uh, I don't even know whether to call communi- uh, China a communist society. Would you call it a communist country? They call themselves communists, but they don't look like any communists I ever saw. And they look like capitalists that are beating us hands down with, you know, playing a much better game of capitalism than we are. So it, it, is that reflected in a change in, in the value system that it's okay to make more money than your na- next door neighbor and be competitive and all of that? I'm asking a lot of silly questions that are all piled in together, but but there's some common thread about this transition from capitalism, I mean, communism to capitalism, or maybe they don't think that's what they're doing. Well, those are a lot of really important big questions. So, I know. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and I shouldn't dump that on you as we're getting caught toward the end of our conversation, but... But those are the, to my mind, the questions I'd like to explore if I were in your six shoes. <laughs> and I certainly spend a lot of time um, thinking about them. Uh, if, if I do this other research, it's because um, I, I'm wanting to make it on the ground and concrete with real people. And uh, sort of the, 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 the summary statement probably about, you know, if one wants the, the aspirational goal of, of the People's Republic would would be that simple phrase from from Mao Zedong, serve the people. Um, And that in in a sense would, um, that gets past some some, some of the finer ideological or or political points, if you think of it in those those terms. So certainly uh, on, the official position in the United States and China, interestingly, but the governments of the, of the two countries are sort of agreed that China is a socialist country. But you know, for quite a long time, you know, Chinese people haven't, you know, since, since the eighties, they sort of suggested that they didn't think they quite had socialism anymore. So they would tell you that they don't see it as a socialist country. Is that it? Even in the countryside, would would, would tell me that because they thought it was being just. Dis- dismantled in the new economic reform. And does that bother them? Did it did did they say, oh shoot, we're losing socialism or goody goody, we're losing socialism? Uh, they, they had mixed feelings about it. To some extent, um, there's greater opportunity and, and well-being, but then they lost some of their, their social supports. In any event, they would they would just sort of comment on it because everybody in China has been through political study, right? So, so the, all these categories are available to people in, in different ways and they, and they comment on them and think about them. Um, what's just dis- been distinctive in, or one of the things that's been distinctive in, in the recent period is that Xi Jinping is very determined to put, um, to make, um, China into, into his idea of a socialist country. And, and that has um, certainly in, in included a, a great strengthening of the role of the party and of state-owned enterprises and of, uh, and of the role of the government. And, and, and certainly claims that China is, is, is leading the way to socialism in the world at present. And there's a, a strong argument that, that China is making to this effect, but nevertheless, it's still quite um, involved in the global capitalist system. So this is a very difficult thing to uh-huh. analyze or, and, and using labels like socialism and capitalism is really complicated because sorting out just exactly how you want to, to think about China in, in, in that sense. In the view of, of many people studying China, I think that you could look upon China as perhaps part of the capitalist world system, but having taken a different route to get there, where it's been really important that it has been through uh, what was more clearly a socialist experience in the, in the 
the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Um, and then that consciousness is still there. And it's alive and well in uh, the, the thoughts of you know, young people in the, who are voluntarily going into the, the informal, the unofficial labor movement in China. So the, these ideas are, are alive and well in China and they're promoted in, in certain ways um, by, by the government of China as well. But then it's also part of the global economy. So, um, and labor power is a commodity and so on. So, you know, basically there are, are it, it's, it's really complicated to, to mm. conceptualize, but you, you have elements that we would recognize as both socialist and capitalist um, in, in China at present in a, in, a, in a complex way. You know, compare Xi with Putin. <laughs> Because from what you've said, it sounds as if she would claim that he's aiming toward a better socialist society. I don't think Putin would ever use the word socialist as an aspiration for his politics. Uh, I don't know whether he'd like to call himself a capitalist either. I don't know what they say, but certainly um, I think the, the role of well, there's no role for a communist, the Communist Party in Russia, but there certainly is a role for the Communist Party of China, and they must have a, a an identity uh, as to whether or not they're more socialist or capitalist. There was a time when I was looking comparatively at other post-socialist societies in the 1980s and 90s, and I looked at the, the Eastern Bloc a little bit more. So I, I can't say that I, I know very much about um, Russia. In, in China, I would say that Xi Jinping, I think, um, is certainly trying to create his version of, of socialism. Um, and I think there's a, a commitment to that. And he does, you know, his father was a, a leading figure in the revolution as well. And he, he's supported by that generation of, uh, you know, the, the children of, of, of the people who um, were decisive in, in, in that era. So uh, he, he comes out of, of that background, but it isn't quite the same. So I guess th there's a question of, you know, just how one's going to c c conceptualize th this other, um, th the path that China is on right now. And when you take your next trip, I want to get back and, and have another conversation about what surprised you. <laughs> Very nice to talk to you, Meta. All right. Take care. Take care. And we'll be back in touch. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.